Hello, everyone. How are you guys today? Good. I can hear an echo. Hopefully, that goes away. Um, so uh, today, hopefully, we're in the right room. Um, I want to talk about tools and tips for tuning and debugging the web. This is sort of a weird talk in that there's no narrative. Um, it's not like some big theme. Um, it's a lot of little things. So my hope is everyone in the room will walk away with one or two things that are really valuable to them that make their lives easier. Um, so there's a lot of kind of disconnected pieces. Some of them you probably know, some you don't, hopefully. And you'll get value out of that. Uh, this is um, an open source project called Reveal.js, the slide deck I'm using. So it's just a website. Uh, the bottom link is my GitHub. You can copy it from there, fork it. You can send me uh, issues if you want to add something to the, the deck. You're welcome to take this and run through it at home. I'll have example, like screenshots built in. And you can use those later to kind of follow along. Um, and then it's live on an Azure website because it's free. Uh, at f12talks-pyohio.azurewebsites.net so you can run this. So just the website, you can go through it later. You're welcome to take this back to Teams or anything else and give it yourself. Uh, it's for you to use however is useful for you. Um, so briefly about me, um, my name is Jared Ferris. I'm a software developer, um, team lead. Um, that image is out of date, so it's more like that now. Um, I, so I've been, I, I've always been a web developer kind of my entire career, and I've done other bits of development, but um, almost everything is user facing on the web for me. So I've built up a decent set of skills on how to figure out the weird things that websites do. And I'm going to share some of those tools and tricks today. I work for a company called HMB. We're a consulting services company in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm our Microsoft practice director. So I work primarily with Microsoft technologies now. We have a Java group. Um, we do, um, actually, we're doing some Python work at the moment. Um, we do a bunch of everything. Um, so, but 75% of our projects are web projects, and the website is kind of the same no matter what you're doing on the server side. So enough about me. Um, I'm involved in a few conferences that I just kind of want to shout out in case you're not aware of them. Um, DogFoodCon is a Microsoft-focused conference that will have cloud and things like that. Cloud Develop um, is a conference that will actually be here on October 23rd. It's a one-day platform agnostic cloud computing conference. Uh, tickets are on sale for that right now. And Star Trek, uh, which is in the spring and is always tied with like a big movie launch, is a one-day like 1,500-person um, plat you know, cross-platform, cross-technology conference also in Columbus. So if you're not aware of those, hey, put them on your radar. All right, so our, our premise today, um, we're all building, if we're building websites, we're doing things on the server and we're running into problems, right? Because software has bugs and we get good at doing that. And um, you probably have the suite of tools that you're comfortable with and whatever technologies you use and kind of your, your process. Um, the pace of development in the client side, especially JavaScript, is really, really fast. Um, and so the browser vendors are releasing stuff all the time to make it easier for you to do the same type of workflow on that side. Um, there are a lot of good tools built into all the browsers. The, if we were to do a Venn diagram, the overlapping part across browsers is really, really big. Um, so I'll mostly do things in Chrome, but I'll talk about some differences across other browsers. Um, and we're just going to go through some of these tools. So um, high-level topics, the first thing, this is really, really short about preventing cache headaches. Um, something, I just want to talk about cache for a minute because it can cause nightmares when you're dealing with client-side stuff. And we'll go into CSS modifications, so working with the styles on the web. Then we'll go into JavaScript pieces, like working with the actual JavaScript code. And then talk about some tools related to responsive web design. And then um, some performance tuning and networking and timelines, things like that. And then I've got a few other topics I'll mention at the end uh, if we have time. Um, caveat, this stuff changes really fast. All of the browsers, now that Microsoft has Edge out in Windows 10, which I'll show briefly, are, are constantly updating browsers. So there's new features constantly. There's something I saw in Chrome today where they changed a button on me. And I'm like, what's that button do? And that was two hours ago. Um, so there's a lot of stuff I don't know about. So if you have things, like if at any point you're like, hey, there's a great tool here, a button you can click here, shout it out. Let's share it. Um, I'm constantly updating this talk. There's um, development blogs for all the browser vendors that talk about the things they're doing. Um, and these are worth checking out as well. Again, all these slides will be online. You can pull those down later. So I'm sure there's super powerful stuff I don't even know about. Um, and if you're welcome to share that. And um, you know, tomorrow there'll be something new that's in there. Uh, so cache headaches. So who here would say they're primarily a web developer? I mean, or that's a big portion of the time, right? It's pretty common. Um, if you're only a like, server-side developer, I have a whole lot of value for you. Um, there's a lot of weird issues that happen when you're working in the web and you're like, things aren't, I, I made a change and nothing's happening. All the browsers have some mechanism for making sure that your cache, so the files, the JavaScript, CSS, everything else, are getting um, refreshed quickly. 
So I open up the dev tools. All the browsers have some sort of like inspect element. That's how I usually open them up. You can also hit keyboard shortcuts. And they all have some sort of setting. So Chrome has a setting, disable cache while the dev tools are open. I think I can zoom that bottom piece in. Let me try this. So they all have something like this where when you're running your dev tools, it will ignore cache. That's sort of misleading. What that means is when you load the page, anything that happens at initial page load, it will get a fresh version from the server. But if you have asynchronous things, like Ajax things happening, it doesn't always apply to that. So they all have some other mechanism for clearing your cache. Chrome has one that's awesome. If, you're, if your dev tools are open and you go up to the refresh button and hold down, you get a menu that has normal reload, hard reload, which means ignore the stuff that's on the first, first request, and empty cache and hard reload, which is delete anything I know about this site and reload the page. If you ever run into weirdness, First thing you want to, if you think your code should be good, first thing you always try is making sure the cache is clean. Um, so I'm going to do that. It'll take a second because I have to load everything fresh. Um, I'm running this off localhost. Uh, I did zero optimizations for images and things in the slide deck, so it's a really big slide deck. So pull down local if you ever want to have a look with it. But that's why it takes a little bit of time even there. So um, browser support. Another thing I want to talk about, uh, who uses Chrome as their primary browser? Okay, Firefox. Does anyone use Safari as a primary browser for development? Yeah, I usually, I might sometimes get one person. Um, who uses IE for their primary browser? Right, no one, right? Um, problem is that, I mean, I'm not sure how they measure this and, and where this is, it's across all countries, um, but netmarketshare.com has their, their metrics and they're dealing with like ads, are still measuring Internet Explorer as 54% of the user base. Yeah, question? Oh, okay. Okay, um, so what my comment, I guess, in general is, we're, if we're building a site that anyone can use, it's, um, it's kind of bad for us to all be in Chrome or Firefox all the time, right? So my workflow when I'm building sites is to switch up which tool I'm using for development, moving between browsers, because it forces me to kind of see what it looks like in a different browser. It's helpful that all the browsers have pretty decent development tools now, because I, I can actually function in all of them, but um, a lot of my teams, and I've even myself in the past, have built an entire site and then at the very end said, hey, we should test this in IE. And depending on who you're targeting, right, that could be a big problem. So one of my takeaways I hope you have from this is since you can do this work in IE, it's probably worth trying it now and then. Um, do you have a comment around that? That's a good point. If, you're, if you have information on your customers and you know your customers aren't using certain versions of browsers, you can change what you're doing, absolutely. Um, I, I, might, I guess like I might say I'm not going to support Opera or something because I have no customers that use that. But it's worth looking at who are your actual users and um, if they have desktop machines and they're non-technical people, right? it's different if you're building Stack Overflow or something. Um, if they're non-technical people, consider the fact that you might want to at least try the browser out some. Um, I'll talk about Edge in a little bit too, but the, I, the new IE, like a replacement for IE is updating constantly in Windows 10. It's pretty buggy at the moment, Windows 10 in general, but um, this is a kind of a cool thing. So I'm, I'm using a Mac, um, probably a fair number I see because I'm in the audience. Remote.ie is a tool they put out, the Microsoft team put out, where you can um, stand up a, an Internet Explorer VM basically and use it for testing, but not have to actually have a Windows box. So I've used this a few times. If, I, if I'm on my Mac, I have Parallels, but if I don't want to use that, I can connect to a free VM. So worth looking at that. Um, and moving on, so CSS modifications. So I used to do part of this talk at where I dive in and show people how to modify markup, and I found that pretty much everyone knows that there's this tool where you can see the HTML on a page and make changes. If you don't, it's you can right-click on something and inspect. So that, there's nothing too exciting there, so I've kind of removed that section, but I do want to talk about the things you can do with style sheets. So um, my workflow generally, when I build apps now, the server is kind of a RESTful API, so it's sending data back and forth, but I don't do a lot of stuff related to markup on the server, um, which means that I'm building things with JavaScript, right? And I, and I have workflows. The user clicks a button, a pop-up opens. They do something, uh, a page changes, and it's all client-side. And if I hit refresh, uh, I have to start over. I get a new fresh load from the server, and kind of all my changes are lost. So I've gotten really good at building just enough of my HTML on the server side to get the page to load, and doing a lot of changes in browser. So if I was working on this page and I was messing with font sizes or something, um, I, I can go in here and make those changes in the browser real time. So let me show you something here. So I have this, this piece, right? And 
let's say I'm working with a designer and, and like I always hear from designers, man, that's ugly, that's not at all what I designed. Why, why'd you do it so badly? Um, I've actually sat down with a designer before, paired with them, um, sat next to them and just worked in the browser making changes. So I can go in here, so this thing on the side, this tab is the styles tab. Is, is, if everyone's familiar with this, I'll move on quickly. Is anyone kind of, is this new to anyone? Okay, so styles, you can make inline style changes. You can, you can mess with different things there. Um, there's, with all these slides, if you want to share this with other people, there's screenshots when I can down below. Um, so, so you can make, you can make inline style changes, right? So that's, that's exciting. Um, a little bit more useful, and this is something a lot of people don't, uh, I'll see people not using this. There's a computed tab, um, Firefox calls it something different, but all of them have a couple features. So there's a box model, so the sizing of the elements you're looking at, including padding and border and margin, that you can change in real time. They have, um, you can use the arrow keys if you're like moving things around to, to change these numbers. And if you hold shift, they'll usually move by 10. So if you're doing weird positioning things, that can be really handy to just make changes in the browser instead of refreshing constantly. And you can also see the inheritance chain of different properties. So, you know, it's one thing to go in here and say, I'm gonna tweak some padding, and then, I don't even know what element I'm on, so that might not do anything. I'm gonna change some padding. But if you're building Let's say you're using something like Bootstrap or another library, so you're inheriting a bunch of styles that somebody else has, and then you're piling on all your own changes on top of that. It's useful to be able to slide down and see, okay, I think I'm telling it to be some color. It's inheriting something else. Why is it not behaving the way I want? And you'll be able to see things that are crossed out um, as they're overridden by another style. So you can walk this and say, okay, I have 15 different style sheets in here. Why am I getting the effect I want? And go through and look at those. So this view is that inheritance for that element and then computed is the sum total, ins instead of broken down by file, the sum total of all the styles that are applying to an element. So you can say, why is this doing something, and see what those styles are. So, you know, not groundbreaking, but useful to know. Um, so, a little bit more um, maybe hidden. This is one of the things they just, this button used to be something else. If you're dealing with things that should have a state, so, um, like this changes when I'm hovering over it. It's hard to see that red on the screen, but. Uh, it, you can, it's hard to kind of inspect that. So if I'm looking at this element, I don't see anything in the style sheet related to that red. This little um, pin button on the right hand side will give me the ability to change the element state. So I can make this be um, hovered and see the styles that apply and then go make changes to that. All the browsers have something like that. They'll call it element state or toggle state, something like that. Um, can be very useful if you're trying to do mostly visual styles. Um, but it's handy and it's hidden sort of. So. Um, another thing would be, um, like I guess, meta properties. So this sentence here isn't a full sentence. You can see that at the bottom. I have this sentence as a F-I-N-I. But there's still some, some letters there. So um, a common use of this would be like you're, you're putting, you have in your um, HTML, you have data that you want, but you want to apply styles to it. You can use style sheets to do that kind of magically, right? They can insert characters and do other things. This little colon, colon, after will let Chrome show you what it's doing with the CSS3 modification. So you can still view some of these things, even though they're not part of the HTML, and make changes. In this case, I had um, an after, and I said put you know, the rest of the words that are there. Uh, a common use case for this would be like font icons. So you have a font or a library that has um, every letter is actually a shape. Bootstrap has something like this built in. Um, some of those will use this where you put in some tag or some attribute, and it will use CSS to insert an image. And if you're trying to figure out what's going on, it's worth looking for the, the after there or some other pseudo um, meta property, I think is the term. So um, color pickers, these are starting to show up in all the browsers as well. If I inspect this background, um, you know, I get into a color. Um, this is really big now, so it's hard to find. Let me, um, let me just pick this font. So if I'm working in browser and I go to this color, I can do selections of things in the document and pick out other colors if I'm trying to match things. So this can be useful if you're trying to figure out what's going on um, or just kind of screw around stuff in browser. I have tools I've, I've had installed in my machine before to do that and it's kind of cool that stuff's just built in. Um, likely, ho hopefully that's not the most valuable thing to take away from this talk though. Um, so this is, this is neat. So Chrome, if you're making changes, so I'm working in browser, it's kind of my normal workflow and I'm changing a lot of style sheets. So I have this F12 style sheet and I'm in here and I'm monkeying around with different things and um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm like, what did I just do? I need to, you know, this, I'm gonna definitely have to refresh this page. 
Um, so I've done this, and I'm, I'm interacting with my page, and I've made a bunch of styles. It's easy to forget like what I did. So I'm gonna reload the page, I'm gonna lose them all. So in Chrome, if I hit save here, uh, I'm sorry, I have to go to sources. If I'm in a file, so, so one of these JavaScript files, so I've got my F12 file, this little star says that's been changed. I can save this to my disk somewhere, like on my desktop or somewhere else, start making changes, and it will persist them to my saved copy. So the minute I save this, um, if it gives me, save as, let's put this into my desktop, um, I can call it something, and it will start using the locally referenced copy of that file now. So when I reload the page, it's gonna reload the one from my desktop. So I can make changes, and then I could do a diff and see, hey, what changes did I make, and, and persist those. That's kind of nice. Um, Firefox does it a little bit better. So if I'm in Firefox, and I'm making some changes here, um, this I did this earlier. So I changed some styling. It's hard to see, but this little green bar, that tells you that that line's been modified. So you can save the file as well, but you can also visually kind of spot this and say, oh, I've, I've changed those three properties. I like that a lot. Um, one of the things that the Internet Explorer Edge does really, really well, so here's my VM, is, and I hope that this gets implemented everywhere. I don't, this is gonna be really hard to see, because, okay. So I can make some changes to styles, um, like change this, whatever this font is, to something else, and I have a changes tab. And that changes tab will list all the files that I've modified and show me a red-green diff of whatever the, the tweaks are. I wish this was implemented in every browser. But if you're gonna do a lot of style changes, it might even be worth considering using the IE tools for that if, you, if that's your flow. Um, but that, that's really nice. But any of these, you can persist kind of what you're doing and figure it out later, which can be useful. Um, all right, so let me go ahead and reload this because I don't know what, what I'm doing there. Um, and I think that's it for this section. Yeah, so um, and again, if you want to go through this later, there's screenshots of kind of the pieces to look for. So my workflow, I think I mentioned this, I tend to build like a rough kind of um, non-data driven, anytime I'm building like a JavaScript control, I build it with fake data, so it's just kind of flat. And I do the finishing touches in browser, I save those, persist those somehow, then I validate in the other browser. So I tend to ro rotate through browsers. Um, I, maybe Chrome might be my browser 70% of the time, 75% of the time, but I do try to rotate the rest of the time. Um, and then after I have that design kind of working, that's when I start to cut up like a template or do whatever it is to, to bind it to data. So to get it to look appropriate, I don't really care if it has real data usually. Um, and then I validate again in the browser. This is kind of my workflow. When I'm working with teams, um, I, I sort of enforce this. So when we're doing like a code review, part of the code review question is like, did you check this in the other browsers? Um, and even that question tends to cause people to be, to be uh, cognizant of the fact that they need to do this. Um, so that's kind of it for styles. Are there, are there any questions around style sheet modification? So the rest of the talk will be JavaScript stuff and like performance stuff. Okay. Oh yeah, in, in your file system. So yeah, you could save that file there. Um, and you could do like, if you're using GitHub, you could do a git diff. Oh, sorry, the question was, rather than saving to your desktop, could you save it where your source code exists? And th the answer is yeah, you could definitely do that. Um, and actually, there's, depending on your IDE, there are better tools to like let you do live changes that push back to your source code. But they're kind of, they vary on your, depending on your IDE and your workflow. But worst case scenario, yeah, just point it to your folder and save. Um, so JavaScript debugging. So um, first thing, consoles. You have a JavaScript console in every browser that lets you run commands and do things. So I can make a variable, you know, and make it equal to something and test it. So when I'm working on JavaScript controls, I'm in this all the time. I'm looking at the state of things and I'm, I kind of live in this, this pop-up or this window. Any other tab you're in, if you hit escape in Chrome, it will open a little mini console to let you in. But then, okay, and then uh, Internet Explorer has some stupid keyboard shortcut for it. But the same idea is there. It's like control tick or something, it's weird. Um, so it's worth knowing you can do that. You can run um, anything you want. I'll, I'll often, if I'm working with an API um, and I'm starting to build something in the browser, I'll open this up and do an Ajax call from the console to make sure I get back what I'm expecting, right? So you have full access to any, any of the JavaScript that that page has. So you can do multi-line commands. So if you, were, if you needed to for some reason, you could say, you know, var test equals uh, a hold shift command and shift enter rather and multi-line. Uh, that's illegal JavaScript though, so it doesn't work. Um, 
And if you're looking at, um, let's, say you, let's say you're doing, you're calling a RESTful API and you're getting back a big old object that has a bunch of properties and children. You know, a common thing would be, zoom this in a little bit. Um, you know, I might have something like some object where A is equal to A and B is equal to another object. So I have my test object. In the browser, you can explore this and you can open things up and look at the properties. That's nice. Um, you can also do console.table. I think this is every browser now. And get, let me give it some more properties. Um, so you can inspect this. I don't know what I'm doing there. Let me make a screen reader. Um, there we go. Well, that didn't do what I wanted to do. Um, let me do this demo because I built one to show this. So I'm going to walk down here, and it's going to write whatever's in my test object to the to the window. So let's look and see what it did. There we go. So so all these slides that have inline stuff, the JavaScript it's terrible, terrible code. The, the JavaScript inline to the slide. So if you're parsing through the slide deck later on your desktop or whatever, the code you need is right there. Don't ever build an app that way. But um, let's get to the slide. So here's here's an example of console.table. So I've got some array of objects and I can, in the browser, kind of view this in a pretty output rather than having to kind of walk through. So that's a handy tool to use sometimes, especially if you're calling a, like a REST API and getting back a list of things for some table or something else. Um, and I believe that's cross-browser at this point. So, okay, another thing, this is really handy and, and a lot of people don't know about this. So you can go into your source code in, in any of these browsers and, and add breakpoints, right? So here's, you can see my, in, my lovely inline JavaScript. Um, you can go in here and you can add a breakpoint, and when it reloads, it will stop at that spot. Um, who, does anyone use CoffeeScript or TypeScript or something like that? So if you're using one of those libraries, the code you're writing doesn't kind of, it doesn't line for line match in the final output. And, and trying to figure out like where a breakpoint would go can be kind of odd. So you can put the debugger keyword in, and you would probably not leave this in production, but that keyword will cause the, the browser to stop there as if you would put a breakpoint. So let me show you that. So fire my example up here, and you can see I stopped at this breakpoint. So I'm in the middle of a click event, so just some hacky jQuery, and it stops at this breakpoint. And I can use sort of standard debugging tools. I can step over, I can go to the next line, I could step out, um, which in this case would go to jQuery, which is not helpful. Um, so if I'm working on something like a callback where I, this thing may not fire right away, it's gonna fire later, it's timed or something, putting that keyword in is helpful. Um, if I was building a big project with a lot of team members, I might have like a commit hook that catches that so we don't leave it, so we don't have to ship to production. But you can say, hey, I, when this callback happens, I want my browser to just jump right to that using that keyword. Um, and you can, of course, add your own breakpoints. If you have the debugger keyword, I don't think any of the browsers will show it in the breakpoints viewer. I think it, it just kind of, when it's executing, it stops there. Um, and if the debug tools are closed, there's no real harm to it. So if you did forget, it wouldn't, wouldn't kill anything. Um, and it happens during a, a callback and that sort of thing. So, um, call stack, we sort of saw this a second ago. I'm gonna fire another demo. So I've got some methods that call other methods here. Just like you'd see maybe server side, um, I, have, I can walk through the call stack. And so I, I have method three calling method two, method two calling method one. I can see that, I can set watches. Um, if, you're, if you use watch variables in other tools, you can do that here. But then in, whenever I move through the call stack, I can see the context that it's operating in. So JavaScript has the, the lovely this keyword that will change and can cause you headaches. Um, if you're getting weird behavior, it's useful to stop in there and walk through and say, why is, okay, this was actually some button, right? So my click was on that button. I've got the right context. And I go here, oh, this is window, okay. My code is relying on that being something else and you can kind of spot those errors. So standard debugging tools, I can continue. Um, I can step out. You know, to get back up to method two, stepping on method two, or two will take me to method three. Those are available to you. Um, hopefully you're kind of familiar with that concept. Questions here? All right. Um, exception breaking. So uh, try catch isn't as common a thing on a website as you would see maybe in, in server side code, um, but it, it, there's no reason it can't be. Uh, I'm going to click this button. It's doing nothing right now. So I have a, a caught exception in some of my JavaScript. Chrome has this button. All the browsers have something like this. This says pause on exception off. If I turn it on, 
it can pause on caught exceptions or not. So I have one that is caught, it's in a try, but because I have turned on those exceptions and said pause on caught, I can walk into this. So it's, you're gonna wanna leave that off most of the time because a lot of times your unhandled except, or your handled exceptions will be in libraries you're consuming. So I downloaded jQuery and it handled something weird. Um, but if, if something's happening that's strange, you can go in here and toggle this and then kind of see what's happening in the browser. Um, but I, I don't know, I don't, I don't write a lot of try catches in JavaScript, but they are in a lot of libraries. So another kind of cool thing, so um, DOM events. So events can ha uh, happen on the page, and as you're building a JavaScript project, especially if you have a lot of third-party libraries, there can be a stack of events that are firing. Things on page load, things on a click in a certain container, things on a click in a link. Um, and sometimes it's hard to see, okay, something just happened, I'm using Angular or something, and my page just changed, and I don't know why. So Chrome um, is the only one I know of that can do this at the moment. If I inspect something, so I'm gonna inspect this sentence here that says it's gonna get deleted. In the editor, um, I can right click and I can break on, I can break on subtree modifications, so anything that's in that element, if it changes, um, attribute modifications, so changes to the attributes of the element or the removal. So if I do removal and I click delete, the browser's gonna stop there on what happened. So pause the node remove breakpoint, set on some target, um, and I can walk through and say, hey, why'd that just happen? Oh, well, here it is. I found my function. Uh, there was a click button that caused that to be deleted. This is really handy if you're getting, if you've done a bad job managing how events are hooked up and you have three events firing at once on something to figure out what's actually happening. Um, I don't know that you can do that in Firefox or, or uh, Internet Explorer or Edge at this point. Um, so now my element's been deleted. So I can, it just treats it like a JavaScript piece. Um, there's another thing I wanna show here. I don't, th I think I may have skipped the slide. You can inspect elements on the page and instead of waiting for an event to happen and using the, that trigger to, to, to catch it, you can look at events that are bound to a particular element. So there's an event listeners option, it's a tab. And I'm looking at the, um, the navigate up arrow. So there's an event that happened when the page is loaded. There's a click event, navigate up enabled, that's in the slide deck code. I could go to that, and I could see, oh hey, when, you know, this is the slide deck causing up to make it go up a page. So I could look and see, you know, this button, if I were to see events in here, you know, if I thought the event that was further down the call stack uh, was the one that should be firing, but there's three more above it, I can figure out what's being bound in properly. So I can kind of walk through those. Um, so you can inspect anything and see the events that are uh, attached to it. So that can be handy. This is cool. So uh, cross browsers now, um, they call it black boxing. The IE team had it first, and it's called Just My Code and IE. When you're working with libraries, um, we saw this earlier, I stepped up out of an event and I got into the jQuery code. It's not uncommon for me not to wanna do that, right? Like I'm, I'm kind of going full in with something like jQuery or Angular saying, I believe that this is useful code and that I'm gonna kind of trust that it works. And I don't usually wanna debug it, right? Usually if there's a problem, it's my problem. Um, but if I have, if I'm moving between their code and my code, it can be kind of a mess. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, fire off this event. So I have some code in here uh, on click and I'm gonna call some third party library that's aptly named third party library and call some method on it. So this is like a jQuery, it's not my stuff. I downloaded it, it's probably minified. Um, and I'm giving it a callback, which is some of my code. So I wanna debug this. When I, when I hit step into this line, I want to step into awesome library dot do awesome stuff. When I step in, I'm gonna get third party library and it's minified and pretend it's 75,000 characters long and it's hard to read. Um, and then if I were to like find the right place, I could step into my callback. So I can go into this list of files and go to third party library and right click on it and black box the script. And from this point on, Chrome will ignore that like it doesn't exist. So if I step into that third party library now, it's gonna skip all the stuff in that file and go immediately to my, my awesome library that's not black boxed. So this could be a, a really, really um, useful time saver. And you can always go back there and unblack box it. So Chrome by default, I think will black box any minified files. Um, in my case, I didn't minify it, but um, I think like jQuery, it automatically just does that. And I think it's because it's .min.js, but you can, you can tinker with that. Um, so very handy. Now I can see that uh, well, a jQuery event happened, there's an anonymous function, this, and then I can see that there's something black boxed, and I can view it if I want, and it's grayed out. So it's saying, hey, I'm skipping that file. Um, so, yeah, 
the relevant JavaScript there. So that can be really handy. Um, the, the button for it in IE, it's uh, like curly braces is like a slash through it kind of thing. Um, and, and Firefox does it basically the same way. They call it black boxing. It's in that list. Uh, let's see here. All right. This is something that if you know about it, you're probably using it all the time. If you don't know about it, it's kind of life changing. So uh, we're dealing with minified code a lot. And um, there are times where you're like, okay, I, I'm not necessarily thinking that jQuery is the problem, like that they did something buggy, but maybe I'm using this library wrong and I don't know why. So you're gonna have, like here's jQuery, you're gonna have you know, these files that are 8,000 columns long, three lines, right, very readable. All the browsers now have a button like this little curly braces here that will do its best to deminify that library. So it can't put back real variable names to something called B, but it can break it up and space it in a way that's readable. And not only that, um, it will let you debug through this. So now that I've deminified this, if I step into the jQuery code, it will step to the correct line. So it's executing this code, um, or it's linking to it somehow correctly. I don't think I have a, a debugger there. But this code is, you can use this basically. And so I could see, hey, I thought I was calling something and passing you know, parameter one to parameter two, my order's reversed. I can look at how they're using it and, and fix that. You can also make changes in here, which often is a bad idea, but you could go in here and mess around with somebody's library. Um, I think I can't do that in the minified. I think I can only do it here. Um, that's not gonna work out well usually, but you can do it if you need to. So <coughs> reload that page. But this curly braces to deminify it can be huge. Um, don't know why it's, oh, I'm breakpoint. Uh, I think I just did something terrible. All right, so that, um, when that first came out, the example of Chrome constantly updating, I was just playing around with something and I saw a little button and I said, what does that do? And I clicked it and then I, my mind was blown for 10 minutes and I just stared at the computer. Finding events, oh, I did, I, I jumped ahead. So I showed you the reveal error, so let's pretend that I just did that now. Source maps, um, who's familiar with source maps? Anyone using them? Okay, so the, the concept of a source map is uh, if you're building JavaScript that has lots and lots of separate files or style sheets that have lots and lots of separate files because you want to structure your, your code or your styles in a way that kind of looks like how you do the rest of your, your software. Um, when you push this production, you probably want to minify it down to like one, one file, right? You don't want to have the browser have to download 35 different Angular JS files that you're making, but you want to build them that way. So there's this idea of a source map, which is just a, let me close this, some document that says, hey, the final file that we're looking at, like out.js, is related to some number of inputs. And you would never build this file. Your, your build system or your, um, uh, you know, s I don't know, you'd have some script, like you could have a grunt task or something, a rake or something dealing with this. Um, every, every s everyone using any sort of server side will have some place where they could do this kind of post-processing. So it'll take all of your output files, push them all together, and make this list that says, hey, browser, when you're looking for X, you can look in Y. So there's a bunch more details about how these work, but there's a good example on this font dragger site. So they, um, most places don't publish their source maps to production. They, they strip that out kind of in development because they don't need them. They, they put it in production, so I use them as an example. So here's their source code. Um, they've got these, these files that are broken down, controllers, directives, all this stuff for Angular. Well, so they don't actually have this, right? The file that they're shipping in production is a single JavaScript file, but they've shipped a source map that tells Chrome what to look for. So I can go through here and debug, you know, well-structured, well-laid-out code. The, the source map allows, if, when it's actually executing that like minified code, it allows it to figure out what line is doing what. So I can turn this off to show you what this would normally look like. So in the, it's really hard, there you go. Enable JavaScript source maps, they're on by default. If I reload this page, you'll see the actual file that the server is serving is just this gigantic you know, mega JavaScript file. So that source map allows the browser to pretend that, or to translate back to the source files that you were working with. Um, the, that's a whole talk on its own about how to get source maps set up and how to use them, but if you don't use them and you're not familiar with them, do some homework and look into source maps. They're very useful. Uh, and then the browser can do the same thing for style sheets as well. So. Um, you can work in a kind of nicely structured environment, but your client, your user can execute, you know, really streamlined stuff. Any questions there? No? So that works. Um, promises. So these are kind of a newer piece of JavaScript. So um, if you've done a lot of JavaScript, like with jQuery, you're, you're passing callbacks around a lot. 
do something and then call this function I give you. And it can get messy and you can have you know, callbacks calling callbacks calling callbacks. Promises are um, a new way of kind of structuring asynchronous behavior. Um, I don't really want to get into the details of those, but if you're using promises, it's worth knowing that in Chrome and Firefox you can inspect them. So I don't have a button for this. I'm going to run this in the console. So this promise, or this code is going to create a promise that just waits three seconds, and then when it's resolved, it passes back a hello. So usually these will be like Ajax calls. So I'm doing something asynchronous, or I'm working with a worker or something. Um, in Chrome, you can inspect these. So I have P1, and it's pending, and it doesn't have a value, and three seconds passed, and it resolved, and I got the value. You can you can treat these like in uh, Internet Explorer or previous versions of browsers, it would just, you'd say P1 and it would show you some object that had a bunch of prototype stuff and it didn't make any sense. The tool now knows what they are and so you can kind of interact with them and kind of query them through the tool. So it's just worth knowing that you can do that. All right, some cool stuff here. So um, I, I kind of think of when we're building websites now that like every website is responsive to some extent. I, sometimes we'll build internal websites where we know the user's on a full desktop computer. But in almost every case, there's some, there's some use case somewhere in the system where somebody's gonna use a phone or use a tablet or something else. And so tools like Bootstrap and other responsive frameworks have, have, make it re have made it really easy to at least allow some level of function for users on smaller devices. Uh, does anyone here work with like consumer-facing stuff that is very responsive? Like I would say like the stuff I build is internal enterprise apps, so it's the limited number of things they're connecting. Who does like customer-facing work, anyone? Um, does anyone work with designers? people who like more visually in, are inclined. Um, the designers I know basically say every single site should be responsive all the time now. Whether that's the case or not, um, it's probably something worth testing. We looked at a couple of our clients. So again, we tend to build internal tools. Um, and so the clients kind of perceived that all of their users were using um, desktop computers. And we put Google Analytics or something else on some of these apps. And we start to realize that even internal you know, tools that are not meant at all for mobile devices ha will have like 30% of usage from tablets because people have their tablets, they're at home, they decide they have to do their timesheet or something and they open it up. And the UIs are almost never built for that. They're pretty terrible. And as we started to talk to, to our clients about that, and they started to realize, oh yeah, you know, I, the exec actually does this on his iPad all the time and complains because things don't have touch targets. We started to get more clients thinking about, okay, maybe we're not building a, re a responsive app that'll work across all devices, but maybe we'll just use some basic tools to give us some amount of ability there. So the browsers are making this easier. They all have tools built in for viewing um, what sites look like in a responsive manner. The best tool is, I think, the one in Chrome. Um, so the Boston Globe is a good example of a responsive site. It's got a lot of breakpoints. Um, it feels kind of newspaperish. It's three column. As we draw, drill it down, it's going to collapse the weather um, to a smaller piece, it's gonna go to two columns. Still kind of feels like the same site, and then down to one column. They're consistent across kind of all devices. This still feels roughly like the full size site did. So Chrome has a viewer that will let you, not impersonate, but um, view this, this little cell phone icon here, will let you view this site uh, as if you're in different devices. So I'll have to reload it one time. So I can tell this to pretend that I'm on um, an iPhone 6 Plus, which is you know the size of that projector screen, and um, view what this would look like. I could try, you know, the more reasonably sized iPhone 6, um, and, and view that. I could try other devices, an iPhone 4, um, and see what these are looking like. I can rotate them. I can just I can just drag the sizing that I want. Also handy if you're building things that are not just going to be used on a local network. Um, you can throttle the the bandwidth, so you can tell this to work like a 2G or 3G phone. Um, it will get slow really quick. Very, very cool if you're doing a lot of responsive work is this little button here. You can see the stair step in the top left corner. This is something else I just found randomly. This will show you all the breakpoints in the site. They have a ton of them. You can click to different breakpoints and see, jump to what the size is, and then see what's happening kind of behind the scenes. So I can even walk into the source code and see in the style sheet what breakpoint's happening and what I'm doing there. So I can say, oh, there's some max width of 1,000 pixels and I'm changing some styles, I can jump right to that. So if you're working with responsive tools, this little stair step thing is can be quite handy. So that was something that even three or four months ago I don't think I knew about. It may have been there, but I'd never found it. So hopefully that could be useful to you. Um, let me go ahead and turn off that phone view. 
so we're getting short on time. Um, I want to go through a couple of performance tools. These, there's a lot of stuff you can do with these. Um, I'm hoping to just kind of make you aware of them, and then we can talk afterwards. You can look online to, to find out more. This tool is a little different, and it's cool. In IE um, 11, it was called the UI responsiveness tool. Now it's called the performance tool um, in Edge. It's a little buggy in Edge, um, and by a little, I mean it crashes all the time. Uh, let's see if I still have it open. So I think it's gone. Let me show you. I made a screenshot of this because it was having some issues. So uh, the performance tab, I don't think I can really zoom that in more. It has a few different things. It has CPU utilization. As you start profiling, and you record the site, and it'll show you CPU. Chrome will do that. The blue bar down here, this is your frames per second. So if you're building um, kind of, you want to build like na maybe native feeling apps, you're shooting for 60 frames per second, 30 plus frames per second of rendering. So anything above 30, people don't tend to notice that the computer's doing something. When they get to about 60, um, it just feels fluid. You can see I was clicking on some stuff on the site and it dropped down. The site felt slow at that point. I clicked something, a bunch of JavaScript had to happen. It felt like I was waiting on something. You can run uh, through a site through maybe like transitions between pages or um, just JavaScript things you're building and profile how this is performing from an end user standpoint. So is it rendering smoothly or not? Um, and then you can dive into the different tasks that are happening, the events. So this, I'll show you the timeline in Chrome. The IE tool has that plus some like UI things that are kind of cool. So it's worth messing with um, because I only have Windows 10 on here and it's kind of buggy. If you have a, uh, access to IE 11 on like Windows 8, definitely check this out. They also have a um, little widget you can open up that will show you the frames per second as you move around the site. Um, and just so you can click around and see what your frames per second are and just leave that open. So kind of nice. Um, I can't really demo it because the Windows 10 uh, install I, I updated is kind of buggy. So we're going to move on from that. Um, I'll show you a timeline that's similar in Chrome. Okay, the networking tab, all the browsers have this. Um, we're going to use somebody else's demo here. This, this has um, the cross-site stuff set up so I can demo it. They all have this networking tab. And I'm going to fire off some Ajax from this button. So the networking tab will show you like what request is being made, the status it got back, and there's a car in the parking lot whose license plate is 200 OK, I saw on the way in, and it's the coolest license plate I ever saw. So um, I'm a gigantic nerd, though. You can walk into this, and you can see the headers that are being sent out. Um, so like, what's, what was the request? What was the response? Um, some other pieces of data there. This is really handy if you're building Ajax things and you're, you're having a bunch of stuff fire and something's not working. It almost always will turn into like something is an error here and you'll have 20 requests and one of them is bright red and you can figure out what's going on. Um, who's familiar with curl? Anyone use curl? You can copy a uh, curl execution command from this and paste it in your terminal and run it from Chrome. I just found this today. Um, just today, literally. But there's my curl, and this is the page that came back. I, I think that's super cool. It's probably been there for a year, and I just found it today. Um, so that can be really handy. Firefox and IE don't have the curl thing, but they all have something similar. This will have cache disabled by default, and then there's more filtering you can do on top of that. Um, Firefox has something on here that's, I think, pretty awesome. So let me get to timeline number 30. So. All right, so network tab, let me go to this demo, Firefox, and check this out. So I can go to network, I can run this request, I can view the request, and I can edit and resend. So I can go in and I can change the headers that I'm sending across with whatever I want them to have and then send the request from the browser. Um, so that, that can be really helpful. So uh, as far as I know, Firefox is the only one that supports that. Let me show you timeline. Um, auditing we may not be able to get to. So the timeline, um, let me give you a story about this really quickly. Timeline shows you all the events that are happening on a page, sort of like the UI view I showed you from Internet Explorer, but without some of the, the frames per second. The cloud develop site, when I was working on it, I had a JavaScript library that we see a little read more link. When you click that, it would open up a speaker's profile and show some more data. Well, it turned out when I did that, it would fire an event for every single speaker on the page. So when I was testing it with one speaker, it was fine. Um, and it didn't scale. And the way I caught it was through the timeline view. So let me show you a really, really, um, Lame example. When I click this button, it's just going to add numbers to the page like 10,000 times to just really slow down the page. Um, oh, let's go back. I don't know what I just did there. Where is it? 32, I think. All right, so I'm going to start recording. I'm going to click this, and it's going to sit for a while, and it's um, ter terribly optimized. It's going to write a bunch of stuff to the page, and I'll do it one more time. And we 
to go to Coitus. I'm going to probably zoom this back out because there's a lot of content here to see if we zoom in that much. So I can see the events that are happening. I can highlight a section of them. I can um, look at all the stuff that's happening on the page. I want to look at, I want to turn off that and that. I'm going to try this again. Um, let's see if I can get the view I want. All right. I'm weird that it's showing me that because I don't actually want some of these features. Um, no, I'm not seeing the view I want. So the nice one demos. Okay. Somewhere in here, this demo is going to not be as exciting because I don't have the right view turned on. I'm not sure what I did. Um, I can see, okay, I can see the events that were happening, and I can walk through. I just clicked this little timeline. I can walk through what's happening. So there was a click. That event is going to not end until the whole thing finished, so it has to kind of wrap up. But I don't care. That's jQuery. Oh, here, this is what happened. I had something in this library, and I can kind of find where this is happening. So if you have events that are making your site slow, you can, and there's a lot of stuff you can do with this tool. You can find those events and kind of see how they fit in the timeline and then dig into them. The DevTools um, site for Chrome has like hu huge walkthroughs for this. So I would say kind of go there if you want to see more details, but know that you can use this to kind of figure out what's happening for events. Um, I'm sorry we don't have more time to go into that. Let me show you auditing real quick because this is something that I, I really hadn't used in production for till just recently. You can run an audit on any page and it will give you, instead of just showing you what's happening, give you actual suggestions about what you could do to make the page better. So something you could walk away with. A lot of them are like clean up where your style sheets are. On a real production page, there's probably gonna be a lot more of these. So worth knowing that tool exists. Uh, again, you probably wanna Google for more stuff. You can also view cookies and storage. So in Firefox, you have to turn this on and I have screenshots below of that. Um, you have to turn on the storage tab. In Chrome, it's the, uh, the resources tab. You can view your cookies. Um, I don't have any on this site. I guess the globe probably will and modify them. So if you're dealing with cookies or you're dealing with local storage, you can use that tool to see like what's happening and then make changes to that as well. So you can do this in browser and I think that's across all the browsers now. And additional tools, I was gonna walk through Fiddler. Um, we're kinda out of time, so I'm gonna probably pass on that. You can, there's some links in, in the slide deck for that. Um, do, you, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so in Chrome, in the elements panel, um, there's an event handling when you, uh, in the right panel, when you click on an element, mm -hmm. right? Excuse, yeah. yeah, exactly. So uh, if you have a click handler and say jQuery is uh, actually the one that's actually putting on it, um, uh, is there a way to um, find out what kind of code that jQuery is actually calling without putting in a breakpoint and then stepping through the code? So, I mean, are you, you're asking, like, if I were to go to this, it'll take me to the line where jQuery is, and if I were to deminify it, I could see what code is being executed, is that? Correct, so if you had, like, an anchor tag, sure. and uh, you had a, a jQuery selector on there uh -huh. to add, um, like, an on click okay. um, to see the code that I wrote. I don't care about jQuery's code, sure. right? Um, okay, so could I see the code that it's calling that it would execute from that point on from this view? I don't know if you could easily di dive into that. Um, um, maybe. I'm not sure if there was like a whole chain of calls, I'm, could you easily identify the one that's yours? I don't think the black boxing feature ties into that. So I'm not sure of an easy way to do that without having to kind of navigate it yourself. Oh, you could use the timeline. So the question, yeah, if you were running the timeline and click that event, then you could see what's actually happening because you'd see the different events in the chain but not from the view, the element browser. You okay. could do it from the timeline. Yeah, so if you have a chain of events, the timeline's a great way to kind of see this one triggered that one, triggered that one, um, and, and then click a link to jump right to the line of source code. So, yeah. So um, you showed how you can unminimize code that you have. Oh, I'm sorry, so you showed how you can unminimize code. But so, so you have a, um, an action that causes an Ajax call that sends a bunch of new mm -hmm. HTML and code. Is there a way to, to get that Nicely formatted, because usually that's, you know, just minimize code that's coming back, minimize. Um, so, like, I, I make an Ajax call and I get back. Yeah, you just get something that's going to replace, you know, 
everything in a div or something like that. And I now I want to, you know, I'm not right sure. now I have to cut and paste yeah. and put in an editor and try to, you know. The only thing I can think of is the network tab response view will show stuff kind of pretty. So if you're doing an Ajax call, you get back the response. Right. Um, I don't know if there's, maybe we can look afterwards see if we can get come up with a situation and click through the tools. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've got a lot of I don't know question answers here, but. So I know with Fiddler you could watch some of the traffic and do this in a more automated mm -hmm. way. It, have you used any of the tools within the browser themselves to say, I want to run my Selenium test and capture all of these attributes from okay. certain aspects? So you want to you want to have these things running kind of um, like get that as right. like part of the test on a server and get so yep. I, I have not done that, but it um, you probably could in that. Um, the browsers will let you save this HAR that mm -hmm. will, it's content you can you can take it from one Chrome and put it to another. There might be a way to have the browser export that, okay. but I've never done it, so I don't know if that's doable or not. Uh, yeah. The go, uh, okay. Well, let's let's talk afterwards because I'm curious yeah. about that too. I just want to say I think you should write like a book or like a long blog post on all these things because these are like these are like the paper cuts that I think kill a lot of people who are trying to like get into this, you know right. what I mean? And it's like literally a death by a million paper cuts and you have like a million band-aids in this one talk that I think can really solve this, so. Okay, well, I need blog content because I never wrote on my blog anyway, so that's not yeah. a bad idea, thank you. Uh, other questions or thoughts, so. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, so I don't, I don't know exactly what you're asking, but there is this, so while, while you're running like a Selenium test or something like that, there is this thing called browser, mo browser, browser mob proxy which will let you create sort of proxies on the fly and insert them into your browser. And then it can export basically all the hard stuff out after it's done running. And then you can take that and look at it, put it in various browsers and stuff that will let you look at that in more detail. Sort of give you the same view as the network right. tab. Um, and actually it's worth mentioning, if, if IE is your pain point, like a lot of people it is, the IE team now has a plugin for that that'll export the same, the Chrome formatted dev stuff. There's a plugin to do that. I haven't used it, but it's supposed to make it so you can use the, the WebKit tools, but still look at their data. So you might be able to automate this across browsers and then compare later. So. And yeah, the one thing uh, we'll always take uh, suggestions, so I'd like to thank you. All right. Thank you very much.